All right, <clears throat> let's dig into some recycling. So we're gonna watch a quick video here um, from um, the city of Tampa that uh, I think opens up the door to some interesting questions on recycling. So for those that didn't see, um, what happened in the video was um, the city recycling worker um, was putting a tag that said oops on it. And it said, um, you know, your recycling wasn't picked up today. And it um, they could check off reasons or write in reasons why um, the recycling wasn't being picked up that day. And so the city of Tampa put this out as like a little PSA of, you know, here's how you properly recycle or like make sure you check out our recycling guides. <clears throat> um, and so, um, so here's a screenshot of what that oops tag looks like. Um, so you can see your car was not serviced today due to the above contamination. Um, <clears throat> and this is a really common thing that happens in a lot of cities, not just Tampa. Um, oftentimes um, cities have vastly different policies on the recycling. Um, I know if, uh, if just having moved from Salt Lake City to Ottawa, Ontario, um, I went, you know, Salt Lake City is very particular about things that you can and cannot recycle. They cannot be mixed together. Um, <clears throat> they also, um, you know, for example, there, you have to sign up for a special glass recycling program um, versus um, in Ottawa, we do have um, sorted recycling. So um, there's weeks that we put out, you know, our one, you know, two through seven plastics, um, uh, weeks that we put out all of our cardboard, weeks that we put out all of our plastics, or sorry, not, I said plastic, but glass. Um, and <clears throat> uh, what's interesting about this is that um, there's a lot of different reasons, both from a policy and a technology standpoint, why we see the differences. So we're going to dive into that in this part of the lecture. So why isn't recycling more accessible for everyone? Um, it seems like any place you move, um, it requires a lot of effort to learn the new system for recycling. Um, and <clears throat> um, we also need to actually invest time and effort into um, recycling things. So <clears throat> recycling programs are based on two things. First is markets. Demand in the market um, means that uh, there's actual payment for post-consumer recyclables, um, and then also municipalities. So government regulations can sustain market demand. Recycling requires equipment, salaries, other costs. Um, and so one of the big variations for why quality of recycling programs, what um, types of things they can and cannot take, the work that um, the folks that are trying to recycle things have to do before those things can get recycled, such as like rinsing things out. Um, those are all determined um, by those two factors of both markets and municipality. Um, <clears throat> and so those will account for the vast majority of differences in recycling programs. Some best practices for municipal recycling. Um, first, um, setting recycling priorities with data. Um, so actually knowing uh, what type of recycling your city is getting in, um, knowing what you can and cannot process within the city and how long it takes to process it. <clears throat> um, also making it convenient for folks. So, um, you know, if I have to rinse out all of my stuff to be pristine or like all of my plastic recycling um, is rejected, I'm probably not gonna be really incentivized to recycle most of my plastics. Um, or uh, for example, if I can't put all of my plastics in one bin and I have to put like my twos in one and my threes in one and my fours in one, um, it's gonna be a lot less convenient for me to recycle and I'm probably just gonna trash a lot of that stuff. Um, additionally, um, incentivizing participation for folks can be really helpful. So for example, um, I might be incentivized to participate if uh, my cost for recycling is a set cost. Um, so let's call it $10 a month. Um, you get curbside recycling for all of your stuff, but your trash is charged by um, the weight, right? If I'm getting charged per weight for my trash, I'm going to be incentivized to try to recycle as much stuff as possible. Um, also, uh, a best practice is making information about recycling easy to find and positive. A really great example um, from the city that I just moved to, Ottawa, um, they have a nice little website where it's called Waste Explorer. I can type in any item like milk carton and I can see 
exactly which bin I need to put it into um, and if there's any special instructions. So for example, um, there might be <clears throat> um, some types of products where they might take one version of it, but not the other, or for example, pizza boxes. Um, if the pizza box is clean, um, like you kept it in pristine condition somehow, totally recyclable, it'll have a little note about that. Otherwise, um, it will note that, um, you know, you should plan to put that in your composting bin. Um, also getting buy-in from collection workers and waste management operators. So for example, um, if your waste management operators um, can clearly see like, oh, there's only like one little thing here. And if I just take that thing out and just toss it in the trash, um, the rest of this is actually good to go for recycling. Um, that requires buy-in from the collection worker to actually do that additional piece of effort there um, to remove the contaminant versus um, <clears throat> just saying, well, we're not going to take any of it, right? Um, the other piece on this too is that the collection worker um, and waste management operators need to kind of play a role in the education initiatives piece of this. Um, and then finally, um, maximize recyclable revenues and create local markets for reuse. Um, again, the two things that matter with your recycling programs are the markets and your municipal uh, governance policies. So for example, if your municipality um, requires um, you know, all types of plastics uh, for government offices to be recycled or something like that. Um, they have now created a market for reliable sourcing for those plastics. Um, and um, you can then go out and seek folks that are purchasers for those plastic items. But the thing is, if you don't have a renewable, uh, reliable source of um, those recyclable items being produced and you get um, folks to buy into that and they are not able to get consistent sources of those things that are being recycled, um, you're going to struggle to actually keep local markets going for a reuse on those items. Um, so here's also a little interesting diagram about um, where waste actually gets sent. Um, so this was 2019 US plastic waste. Um, these are the top 15 states exporting to countries with poor waste management. Um, and so um, you can see Hong Kong is receiving a lot um, of waste exports here um, for plastics. California, if you take a look at it, like they are exporting huge amounts of their plastics. Um, they frequently, like the state frequently boasts that it has one of the, um, you know, lowest like waste uh, rates in the U.S., um, but a lot of it's because how it's calculated is um, the waste that is processed within the state. When you export a lot of your waste, it doesn't count against you. Um, the U.S. sent its plastic waste to other countries, shipping 80, uh, 68,000 containers to Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand in 2018. These countries later instituted bans on imported plastic waste, and the U.S. diverted its waste to Cambodia, Bangladesh, Ghana, Laos, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Senegal, countries with cheap labor and lax environmental rules. The U.S. still ships 1 million metric tons of plastic waste abroad, often to countries already overwhelmed by it. Experts estimate that 20 to 70 percent of plastic intended for recycling overseas is unusable and it's ultimately discarded. One study found that the plastic waste exported to Southeast Asia resulted in contaminated water, crop death, respiratory illnesses due to toxic fumes from incineration and organized crime. So a really important piece to keep in mind here is that um, even if your municipal program accepts um, the recycling that does not necessarily mean it is being recycled locally, um, and so these, this is something that you really want to look into. As much as possible, you should just try to reduce um, your usage of things and production of any type of waste or recycling, um, because the fallout can look like this. It can look like our waste um, and our recyclables getting exported to other places that are already overwhelmed with uh, waste products from the global north. So in evaluating whether your municipal recycling policy is actually good policy, um, is the policy based on data? Um, is your city actually collecting the types of recycling it's receiving? Is it actually tracking like what percentage of recycling is able to be processed? Um, uh, is the policy funded or resourced in some way? So for example, um, does your municipal recycling program, um, is it self-sufficient with funding because you found like a market that's workable enough? Um, so therefore, are you able to take in maybe other sources of recyclables that maybe don't generate revenue. Um, 
because you have successful enough buyers and other um, products of recyclables. Um, are a variety of stakeholders consulted and involved in implementation? For example, um, recycling programs are often um, more accessible in wider, higher income communities. Um, do you actually um, have recycling programs in your low income areas of the city? Um, are you actually in, uh, invoking a variety of stakeholders? For example, um, you know, the city of Tampa here, uh, even though the TikTok's a little cringy or whatnot, um, it's interesting because, um, you know, somebody could pause the video and actually see, hmm, I, I had no idea that I couldn't do X, Y, Z things for my recycling. Um, and more people are likely to be on um, social media tools like TikTok or Twitter or Instagram. Um, and so when we talk about stakeholder engagement, we also, like, that also goes into outreach. Um, so thinking about um, who is maybe over or underrepresented in recycling efforts and how can you engage people that are underrepresented in those efforts? Um, and then finally, um, you know, is there a plan to evaluate effectiveness of the policy during or after implementation? This also goes into the stakeholders piece as well. So for example, if you have a weight, you know, a recycling plant um, that is located in a low income area that you know is going to produce some emissions as you process your recycling. Um, that is an equity issue and you need to make sure that stakeholders are involved and consulted um, in the implementation of, you know, building that recycling plant. Um, Additionally, um, you need to evaluate during and after, are there health impacts that were unintended? Um, are you ensuring um, that the, um, you know, you're not just taking in a bunch of recycling that's then having to get exported to other countries for further waste production? you know, waste post-processing. Um, so how is your city actually evaluating whether their recycling program is effective or not? Are they giving regular updates on these things? Are they consistently tracking data on it? Those are all important questions to ask. Um, also, um, this is a good time to talk about what types of limitations do cities experience when it comes to city climate change policies. So we see that um, cities will often face challenges with, um, federalism, so things like plastic bag bans. Um, there are states like Missouri that have banned plastic bag bans at city levels. Um, utility coordination can also be really challenging, um, including um, things like waste processing. So for example, there can be sometimes state-owned waste processing plants or state contracts um, that require the use of particular um, recycling or waste management um, contractors. Um, so coordinating with state levels um, for utilities um, and waste processing is really important um, and can um, provide some significant limitations to the effectiveness of city uh, climate change policy. We also see um, sometimes some misalignment with federal policy um, for good or for bad. So uh, for some time, uh, sometimes federal policy um, is um, sets much lower benchmarks on things. Um, and so if cities try to set more aggressive benchmarks, um, there can be pushback from, you know, businesses located in those municipal areas um, as to whether the federal policy or the, the city policy is the one that actually um, governs um, that, that particular area. And then finally, financial limitations. So um, this is an area, especially with recycling, where this comes into play. Um, we do see um, some pretty significant financial limitations for cities having to scale back municipal waste reduction programs or scaling back municipal recycling programs because of just limited revenue um, and uh, those financial limitations. Um, here's also a little interesting map as well about where we're starting to see state preemption legislation with plastic bags. Um, so um, Utah right now doesn't have a statute that um, bans like banning plastic bags or bans banning straws or anything like that. Um, there were some attempts in the Utah legislature, but it didn't ultimately end up going through. Um, there are a number of states though that have preemption legislation. Um, so you see Missouri on here, Colorado has one, Idaho has one. Um, and then um, you see um, there's kind of de these like de facto um, fees or taxes that um, so for example, Virginia and DC, uh, localities can implement a tax for plastic bags. Um, and then um, for um, the one in dark blue here, um, these are de facto statewide bans on plastic bags. So Oregon, California, Washington, Maine, et cetera. Um, you, you know, 
there's no plastic bags. So um, when we come back, we're gonna briefly talk about emergency preparedness, as well as how you can actually, um, you know, get your city um, to take on certain action for climate change. We'll talk about networks and then we'll wrap up.